So, did we just get a notification that we're on? I did. Sweet. Okay. Arcade radio. There's a new live stream. I'll connect to it. Look at that. <clears throat> Tony, do you want me to send you the link so you can follow along on the chat if you want? Uh, yeah, sure, if you like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You uh, probably want to turn down the audio when it comes up because it'll... It'll echo and repeat. Okay. So that should be the link. So if we are lucky enough to have any 10 a.m. chatters, <laughs> and some of them probably don't even know we're doing this on Sunday, so they'll be like, why Sunday morning? What's going on? Uh, you can just blame me. It's fine. <laughs> So it's actually Sunday afternoon. What is it about four fifteen there right now? Yeah. All right. So should we roll with the intro and then after you uh, hear "Welcome to the Show," Tony? That's when we'll do the introduction. Cool. Okay. All right. Um, Mark, are you ready? I'm. I'm here. I'm ready to participate. Okay. I'm gonna play the first voicemail, then I'm gonna jump right into our intro. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Two gin and tonics. Yeah. Extra gin. Okay. Hi. Yeah, so I'm at Piccadilly Circus, and I'm, like, trying to play this Monaco GP game, but, like, all the cars are on the wrong side of the street, and they just keep crashing into me, and I just don't understand what's happening. <laughs> no. No olives. Yeah. So then I went to play pole position, and the same thing happened. And I picked my lucky pink car, but the same thing happened. They kept running into me. So something's wacky with your car machines here. And then, what was that other game? Joe, with the cops. Yeah, APB. So I played APB, and the cop pulls me over for driving on the other side of the street. So I don't know what's going on here, but I need my francs or euros or whatever, I don't know, it was a big coin, there was a lady on it, I need all those back at the end of the day. Or you can just buy me some more. <laughs> Bye. Live. Live from KOIR Studios in Minneapolis, Minnesota, this is Arcade Radio. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 7 of the Arcade Radio Podcast. Today is Sunday, 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 January 21st, 2017, and the time is now approximately 10.15 or 10.18 a.m. Central. Thanks for joining us in the Arcadosphere. This is your host, Adam Stevens. I am joined by the legendary Mark Shields of Meet the Time Runners, and the guest host of Arcade Radio this week is... The arcade blogger, Mr. Tony Temple. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's nice to be. All right. Hey, and now I'm legendary. That's awesome. Well, I had I had to throw that in there. You know. I like it. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> if if the if the legendary Dave Reed ever shows up again, we'll give him his title back. Okay. Good. Um. So, uh, 
this is the part where we kind of give a little informal introduction, talk about what we've been working on. So, Mark, why don't you introduce yourself to Tony? Hey, uh, let's see. I'm Mark Shields, Time Runner on The Clav, 90-minute tape on the Twitter. And I've been collecting for about four years. And what else oh, do I say? And how? Jeez. I mean, I, I collect video games, arcade games, movie cars. Yeah. Uh, I think that's it. And then there was an action figure thing that I did in the 90s, which I'm trying to get out of. It's what, terrible. What, <laughs> what are you working on right now? Oh, right. So yesterday I realized I had a two bit ABC PCB daughter board for Pac Man. Do you have you ever heard of that? No, no. I'll, I'll run that it's by like me. It's like a multi board, but it's pretty old and it's made by some company in Austin. And I just happened to have one. And I noticed uh, that it has piranha on it. Like I was in the oh, bathroom yeah. doing some thinking. And I happened to come across the screen and it said Piranha. Anyway, so I have a Piranha cabinet with no way to play Piranha. And so I thought, hey, I'll take my Miss Pac-Man PCB and I'll put this thing in it and then I'll play some Piranha. And then I ended up killing it. Oh, no. Yeah. And, and then I pulled my other Miss Pac and then I had three, you know, dead PCBs all day long. So I was in a super mood. Oh. I mean, I wore sunglasses at the grocery store <laughs> because I... Because I'd murdered Miss Pac-Man. I have a similar story coming up, but yeah. So tell us the rest. What what happened? I fixed it. I mean, awesome. I got one of the PCBs that I had in the box actually going. The only thing it's not doing is the dip switches aren't like it doesn't recognize them. Maybe dip switches go bad. Hmm. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So that's so that's, that's what, what you've been I working on. Spent so much time. <laughs> how, many, how many hours? Like five. Huh. But now I know a lot about Miss Pac-Man and Pac-Man boards, so maybe that's good. It is good. Tony, okay. Tony, Tony Temple is our guest today. Tony, why don't you uh, introduce yourself to us and tell us a little bit about what you've been working on. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Hi. Um, well, I am Tony Temple. I, um, I run a blog uh, called ArcadeBlogger.com. Um, I, you may have guessed I'm not a Native American. I'm over over here in the UK, which is a bit odd, really. I'm I'm, I'm sort of writing about a subject that is very US centric, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, which which creates a few challenges on a on a very basic level. So things like spelling. <laughs> so you know, organize. Do you spell that with a Z or do you spell that with an S? Like, yeah, you guys spell it with a Z. A Z, yeah. And Z. we spell it. We spell it with an S. So I, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm hosted by WordPress. So I get, it's really stressful. I'll, I'll, I'll write out an article. WordPress will try and tell me what I've spelled wrong, <laughs> and then I'm thinking, well, hold on a second. That's not how I spell that word. <laughs> but of course, WordPress is an an American company, so it's trying to correct everything in American. And then I think. Do I need to write for a UK audience or given that most of my readers are in the US, do I accept the correction? And then that messes with my OCD. But that's, that's <laughs> an ongoing, an ongoing issue. Um, and obviously, aside from that, it's, it's my, my perspective of, you know, the world of classic arcade games is, is, is probably slightly different to um, you guys over the water there. Um, right. Because, well, I'm going to I'm going to right I'm going to halt you right there because uh, I want you to tell that story in a little bit. So okay. that that's uh, that's I think that's our first question, and that's that's awesome. So Arcade Blogger, well, by the way, we've used your website as a source many times, uh, at least two or three times in the last year. So uh, fantastic! God help you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe five or six times. So okay. what are you working Social on? Just what are you working on okay. right now then? Well, right now, last week, I was lucky enough to go on an arcade raid of sorts. Um, so I got invited by a collector friend of mine, um, and we went to uh, Wales, uh, which is a small part of England, or, sorry, small part of the United Kingdom over to the west. Grace Kelly. And, uh, we, uh, we drove for four hours and we ended up in a place called Haverford West where there was um, an operator who still operates, but he now mainly operates um, uh, fruit, what we call fruit machines. So I guess you'd call those bandits. 
and um, jukeboxes and pool tables. But obviously, back in the day, he used to operate um, classic arcade games. And it's this big, huge warehouse that's a com- that was a complete mess. And when things stopped working, they literally threw them on shelves. And then over the last 30 years, they've thrown more stuff on the shelves. So it was a case of clambering around and climbing through things. So we we, we pulled out a load of dusty boards. Um, and I brought home, I don't know, probably 15 ART boards. Oh, nice. And um, so I've been... Uh, dare I say it, brace yourself, I've been washing them in the bathtub. Oh, that's, nah, I don't even care. You know, we, I spray mine with Simple Green over here, and I've, 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 oh, heard, of, I've heard of people actually um, uh, putting them in the dishwasher. dishwasher. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Mrs. Arcade Blogger would um, leave me if I ever did that, so I, I, <laughs> I ha- have to wait till she's not looking, and then I take over the bathroom and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, hose them down in the bathroom so they've all come up pretty clean um i nice. guess the next job will be to test them so they're currently drying um in the airing cupboard so that's what i've been doing i'm covered in scratches my hands are as dry as the arizona desert um <laughs> that's that's what i've been working on currently one of my favorite bond singers is from wales shirley bassey i think she's like okay yeah she's 81 now I know she still looks great, actually. Yeah, and she she released an album like five years ago, maybe maybe a little longer than that now, but still, she's still singing, which is awesome. Uh, yeah, she 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 was on the TV. Um, oh, it must have been a few weeks ago. Still, still still got the voice. Still still doing it. I can't believe that. It's just amazing. Mm. So uh, I'm Adam Stevens. I'm your host. Uh, I'm glad to have you on board here. Um, I've been working on some some similar stuff. I actually. Um, I just sprayed down a couple of PCBs with Simple Green last week. Uh, I also um, w- was working on my Bally Mr. and Mrs. Pac-Man again because I finally got the solenoid I was going to put in. I talked about that on the last show. And um, the solenoid's diode was reversed, and I hooked it up, and the solenoid driver board um, blew the transistor and burned almost burned a hole in the board with the resistor so the the magic smoke left the game yesterday and i would i I was kind of in your place yesterday mark i was so mad i was just you killed mr and miss pack i at the same time it was a double murder they were holding hands yeah i think i've talked about murdering them a couple times now (laughs) not a good week for the pack fam (laughs) no (laughs) sorry that's um yeah so anyway i um, I ended up fixing it right away. Probably had it back up and running in thirty minutes, but I haven't. Uh, I haven't reattached the solenoid yet, and I have to test the diode before I put it all back together and let it let it rip. So, yeah, there's a way to make sure it's going in the right direction. So if you need some help with that, just yeah, I've got <laughs> I. <laughs> Well, you know, it's a diode. I know how a diode works, you know, okay. it lets power in one way and not the other. And, uh, I've got a, a di- I have a tester, I have a, you know, a multimeter, so, or a multimeter or however you want to say it, but I have, um, a way of testing it to make sure it's still good. Uh, I just need to make sure I hook up the right wires in the right spot. So, oh, let me turn. You let, let you turn what? I had to turn off loopback. Apparently, after twenty minutes, it's it starts generating a lot of white noise to make you buy the license. Oh yeah, I paid for it. <laughs> <sighs> I'm not ready. I, I'm waiting for my uh, settlement check. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that was one of my early purchases for the show. It might have been the first purchase for the show. So that's because that's how I record everything. That and Audio Hijack, same company, right? Man. Yeah. Audio right. Hijack is just awesome. You should get it. It's super cool. Okay. You can do so much with it, and it's all WYSIWYG, dra- drag and drop, super easy. I love it. I'll look into it. Yeah, you should. So I is spo- that it? That's what, all you're working on? I, that's, well, yeah, pretty much. I spent the entire day yesterday working on that darned pinball machine. Like five hours? Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah. 
<laughs> and, oh, and Christine dropped our one coffee craft. So this morning I had to drive to the grocery store to buy coffee. So I don't know what that means. Dropped a coffee craft? Craft. He's a carafe. We have a, oh, okay. you know, a, You're being I, I'm so kind of picky tech. about my coffee. So I like it to be made and I like to have served out of, you know, porcelain or glass or glass. You know, don't like stainless. Don't like plastic. So. Right. Is that a thing? Coffee in carafes? Well, it's a, it's a vacuum. Um, it's, it's just a, a normal coffee pouring carafe. So it's like a, I don't know, it's an insulated carafe and it has an insulated vacuum tube inside it. Wow. Jeez. Okay. Yeah. So they used to make That's those it. in the 70s for those big thermoses. So it's essentially just a thermos, you know, with a lid. But. Anyway, we'll show us that one day. She dropped it, and the glass tube inside it broke. So, and it was a vintage one that I bought from Japan. So, I'm busting her out on the show now. She already feels bad about it. <laughs> she can find it. Out. I actually sent the company a um a note because they have replacement parts, but I don't know if they have one because this one's pretty old. So. Anyway, moving on. I think we should get over to uh, the the news, maybe? Yeah, why not? Let's right. do it. All right. It's the Arcade News with Adam Stevens. Well, it's the Arcade News with Adam Stevens. Oh. And that's you. Well, I was I was gonna start off, but since this is a Houston-based ad, why don't why don't, or news article? Yeah, I, I stuck not? this here because my DeLorean is gonna be attending this party. Yeah. So yeah. the news article is the Houston, Texas-based Game Preserve is celebrating their fifth anniversary this month with a party this Friday, January twenty-six, two thousand eighteen. Cool. They're at seven forty four seventy-five Sawdust Road. That's near the Woodlands in Texas. Um, there's, wo- a, there's woods in Texas? Like, the Woodlands. So the Woodlands is like this neighborhood where they said, hey, let's put the forest in front of everything so that you don't know that there's anything there. You, it feels like you're driving through forests, but then once you pass like the subterfuge of forests that they surround everything with, you, you know, you're you in like, oh, now we're in a strip mall or now we're at the <laughs> mall. Or... I think that's funny because I just always picture Texas as a big desert wasteland. Well, I mean, it is it is pretty ugly. I mean, the same stores repeat themselves every 15 miles or something like that. <laughs> well, look, the there's another Cracker Barrel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you don't know that it's a Cracker Barrel. You just know that if you pass these, you know, trees, there's a Cracker Barrel, you know, surrounded in the middle. Or, you know, does that make sense? I don't know. So tell us a little more about this. Right. Um, it's the result. This, this uh, place is a result of five uh, collectors here in town. Uh, they used to have stuff in a storage, and it you, you, there was a gate, and it was very awkward. Then they were in a church, um, which I thought was funny. And then the the building, uh, whoever owned it, decided they needed to demolish it. So that now they're in a pretty nice place, and um, it's got your traditional seventies, eighties, nineties games. Very family oriented. It's a free play type place. Sweet. And uh, it says fifteen dollars for the whole day, and you, oh, the the good thing about it is it's not a bar, but you can bring your own beer inside. So it's a BYOB. Oh, yeah. I like those kind of places. Those are awesome. Yeah, those are fun, right? Yeah, and then and you, they, they sell snacks. Yeah, and and they have like uh, goth girls that um, won't talk to you or make eye contact <laughs> at the at the front desk. <laughs> it's always I good don't to know why. It's great to have them at the front desk too. Yes. Let's get the it, most unfriendly people to welcome you to this place. Well, my wife also is sort of like that and so it's I like I tell her to talk to the other one and then they just <laughs> exchange the bare minimum of words. Uh, I think that's generational actually. I'm yeah. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I don't know. I knew some people like that when I went to high school. Well, I guess I'll do the second one here. 1982 arcade game Frontline is now available on the PS4. Retro enthusiast Hamster have added another title to the arc- arcade archives range. The ever-expanding catalog is designed to release arcade classics of yesterday onto today's consoles, with Hamster recently stating that they hope to put out over 800 titles. 
So oh. yester- yesterday uh, saw the release of Tato's 1982 or Taito uh, 1982 arcade Frontline um, brought Screaming into 2018 on the PS4. Yeah, yeah, Screaming, Screaming. So no, don't. What what's happening? I don't I don't like Frontline very much. And so, I don't either. I have a I have a Taito Frontline cabinet that was converted, mm-hmm. and I don't want to make a Frontline. You know, don't want to restore it. So it's going to be. <laughs> You're going to turn it into a Jungle King? I, I'm not really a fan of that. Probably, you know, your traditional zookeeper or something. You don't like Jungle King or Jungle Hunt? Eh, I mean, it's just a bunch of jumping from vines, right? Maybe, well, you know, maybe I should play a little bit before making You that. also have to swim and get away from crocs, and then you have to yeah, jump yeah. over boulders that are trying to crush you. So you prefer that over zookeeper? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to get the title multi-board anyway, so it'll be a bunch of stuff. There you go. Yeah. So I'm going to let you take this last one too, Mark, because this is all your jam. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I have to tell, there was a dearth of articles about arcade games that didn't involve a barcade. So <laughs> the silver anniversary of NBA Jam could resurrect the franchise, even though it doesn't really need resurrecting. Um, Why is that? Um, well, I mean, I think that it's still doing well by itself because... It's one of those, you know, go-to games. You always see it in the classic, uh, you know, arcade with classic 80s stuff. Really? And I, I still haven't seen one. <laughs> For sure, it's at um, Up Down. Really? Oh, yeah. I'll have to go check it out. All right. Um, Mark Shermel actually, was the creator, uh, and he, he started working on it. Oh, it, so it's a 90s game. Yeah, he 93. Started working on it in 93. Yeah. Um, and the challenge for them was to pick the best players on each team. So he sat down with his sound designer. This is interesting that, and then they picked the os- the rosters, and uh, you know they were looking at the newspaper and everything like that, and it turned out that their decisions were like almost spot on. It's kind of a funny, funny little story here, but um, the the story as far as it being modern times on Saturday, which I think was yesterday, the LA Clippers celebrated the 25th anniversary year of that video game classic. Uh, when they hosted the Sacramento Ki- Sacramento Kings for NBA Jam Day, so that's too bad. I wish I could have gone. Fans will receive an eligible NBA eligible fans are, are receiving an NBA Jam T shirt with Blake Griffin and DeAndre Jordan, and someone could even win an original four player arcade machine of NBA Jam. What? Oh, this is cool. Tim Kritz. Kits Grow, the original voice of the game, will be heard throughout the Kings Clippers contest during pregame introductions and timeouts. Tim Kits Row is also the guy that does the uh, the voice uh, for NBA Fast Break, the, the pinball. That's He's pretty cool. He's yelled at me many times. I've played bad a lot. Basketball, huh? Uh, are there a lot of basketball teams up in the UK, Tony? Or is it just us? I'm, I'm... Yeah, this is. I'm I, all I'm hearing is white noise. Uh, this all means nothing to me at all. Basketball <laughs> is, uh, right, right, right. I, I have no idea what what you guys are talking about. NBA Jam, I'm familiar with, but um, no, I can't say basketball has a big following over here. Sorry. Mm. If they could just make cricket jam, maybe or now you see now now you're talking or rugby jam. Oh, rugby jam. Okay, I'm into that. With or everybody... football. <laughs> That's awesome. There's plenty of foot- I, uh, there's plenty of soccer games though, right? Yeah, there's a few well, football. Yeah, yeah, is football. What do you? What is soccer? I, I call. I said football, football first. I I was, I used the Queen's English first, and then I said soccer for all the people. Yeah, the Queen's a robot. I don't know if you know this, but yeah, um, soccer, or football, soccer is is um is a big staple of arcade games. The the FIFA franchise. Yeah, you guys get that over there, but you know FIFA is. Enormous. Both both my kids play it massively, and um, it, it, it uh, you know everybody goes crazy for the new FIFA game, which of course means that last year's game becomes worth about you know one pound <laughs> because everybody trades it in for the new one. That's like the new. So there's a. That's the same thing happens a with, uh, somewhere. Sorry. Up in the north of England, which is you know in in the spirit of ET is that there's a landfill somewhere up up, uh, <laughs> up north here in England full of old copies of FIFA. That's very similar to Madden around here. The Madden right, football yeah, yeah. franchise, American football. So, hey, guys, guess what? We have people in the chat. I'd like to wel- welcome Mike Martin, Dave from Buffalo, Ty Laurie. Ty's in there. Give Zero FX, 
uh, we got we got a pretty hop and chat. Casey's in there. Casey said, "Where the heck is Dale Reed?" Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. That's where you should play the uh, the Dale Reed uh, sound <laughs> clip. How fast oh, can you get to that? Oh, I can get to that in like nothing flat. I mean, you really want to hear it. That thing is horrid. It's yeah. horrid. I can't imagine people are using it, but whatever. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to have to go and dig out some more of those clips. Yeah, we we should just have virtual Dan Reed. <laughs> we you can, know, just get him saying yes and no and a bunch of <laughs> variations on that. And, and then we can just have virtual Dan and, Reed. And, and go on. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> he always oh, yeah, says yeah. that, go on. <laughs> or how you doing, buddy? <laughs> how you doing, buddy? Yeah. No, <laughs> sorry. We're just having a little fun. Okay, so let's, Um, I think we got to move on. I, I yes. Think, all right. So, yeah, that was that was fun. Getting though. closer to the interview. All right. Back in '82, I used to be able to throw a pigskin a quarter mile. Back, back to the, to cave, the cave with with time runner. Why are things so heavy in the future? Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull? Hey, folks, jump in the DeLorean with me. We're going back to January 21st, 1986. A mere 32 years ago. Uh, let's talk about what was new in the uh, arcade or really video game technology news. Uh, some new companies formed in 1986, which is good because a lot of companies went out of business um, in uh, 85. Uh, let's see what we got. Let's see if you remember any of these. Acclaim, Majesco, uh, Ubisoft. Mm, no, Ubisoft. I know Ubisoft. Bethesda, I remember Majesco. No. Yeah. Bethesda Softworks. Yep, remember them. Trade West? Yep, Trade West. I have all these titles in my Apple IIc catalog. Oh, that's what you got to do to, to to recognize these, I see. Um, 1986, Imagic bit the dust. That was some of my favorite Atari 2600 games. Oh, Atlantis. Oh, yeah, yeah. Demon Attack? Demon Attack. Oh, that was on every every console, too. Yep. Speaking of that, uh, Tony. I'm Hello. I magic or magic. Do you remember uh, Demon Attack and Atlantis? Oh my god! No, do you know I I completely missed the twenty six hundred bandwagon. Ah, oh. My neighbor had one. Jamie Upton was his name, and um, he did not want to share. Oh, oh. so I, I what I, a I, jerk! I, my knowledge of twenty six hundred is is fairly limited. I'm sorry. Oh. Jamie Upton, and he's joining us today. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Listen, Jamie, how do you feel about treating Tony the way you did? Uh, whatever. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Jamie. Whatever happened to him? Well, you he's, know, people that don't share don't make it very far in yeah, this world. Doing 30 to yeah, the he's, he's probably still sat there somewhere <laughs> in his basement playing his 2600 all by himself. <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious! Regretting what what might have been. I oh, know. Well, I I was um I had a ZX Spectrum, which I think was a very UK centric thing. Um, it was a very small personal computer with rubber keys that parents were persuaded to buy for their kids because you know it was going to help them with their homework and get them into computers and start programming. Oh yeah. But of course, it was purely a games machine. So we uh, the Spectrum we, you know, ZX or whatever. The ZX Spectrum, it was known as, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. So, and so that was a small wedge-shaped um, console with like a keyboard, like a touch keyboard on it. Is that right? Yeah, it had like a, a sort of dead flesh keyboard. Yeah. And um, it was probably, I don't know, 10 inches by, by 7 inches, something like that. So yeah, a tiny little thing. thing. Yeah, yeah. So um, and did you ever yeah, play OutRun on that thing? Yeah, there was probably a very bad version of Outrun, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and despite it being a color, a color computer, I only had a black and white portable TV in my bedroom. Sure. So I spent years and years playing this machine in various shades of black and white. Huh. And then obviously, obviously, when I was older, and I, um, you know, uh, things came back, and I was able to watch videos of ZX Spectrum games. Yeah. On YouTube, I couldn't. There was this glorious, you know, technical spectrum flying out the screen at me, and I thought, you know, well, <laughs> I missed out on all of this stuff. Yeah. Oh. So, Mark, what was the next piece there? 
Right. Okay. So now we're going to go through what was the media happening 32 years ago today. The Top Gun ripoff, Iron Eagle, reigned as the number one film at the box office. It Wait. was a Metro Color American Canadian action <laughs> film. How could it be a ripoff that came out in the same year? Mm, uh, did it? No. No, it definitely came out later. 86? Top Gun released Iron Eagle. Hold on a minute. Let's see here. Iron Eagle's 1986. Yeah. Okay. Top Gun. Well, I mean, maybe they were both made at the same time? Probably. Yeah. They, I mean, they were released two, two, three months apart. You know, that, that'd be good trivia to look up. Maybe they, maybe they released Iron Eagle first because they, you know, thought, hey, let's make sure. Yeah. Because Top Gun to the punch. I think Iron Eagle's, uh, you know, a far, inferior film but i i think they were it was just like happenstance well, that they were both directed released. by sydney fury who also directed the wonderful superman 4 oh yes it starred just jason gedrick and lou lou gossett jr and the funny thing about it is if you look at the iron eagle poster mm-hmm. the guy that's not lou gossett is wearing like terrible blue jeans like they're just clunky and weird looking it just makes you appreciate that blue jeans technology has come so far <laughs> <laughs> that, so I'm gonna give everybody like five seconds to go Google it and then come back. Are you back? Okay, good. Let's move on. <laughs> I'm I'm putting a chat in the link for everybody. Uh, uh, American TV we had link on our chat. ABC network. Who's the boss? Growing pains, moonlighting, and uh, Spencer for hire. And uh, on CBS, there was actually a Miss Teen special and a Muppets 30 year reunion. I don't know in what order those two went. <laughs> 30 years in 1985? Wow. They're like 60 years old now. Yeah. That... And on NBC, the quality levels were high with the A-Team and Riptide. Oh, my. I loved Riptide. Riptide. That must have been its last season, though. Because the only thing was only like a year, season and a half or two seasons. It was barely ever on. It had that pink helicopter. Hmm. Wasn't there a robot, too? What? I... Hmm. Riptide. I don't even remember it. I, it's... Perry, far back there. Perry King? Nope. He, he, he played uh, Han Solo in the audio version of Star Wars. <laughs> I got my nerd glasses on. Han Solo? Yeah. He played Han Solo in the, in, the, um, in the radio version of Star Wars. He played, yeah. Let's I see. Yeah, it, was, it was good. Laugh it up, fuzzball. So, it was good. Awesome. Uh, uh, is this where we're going to play Name That Tune now? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if this is working or not. I well, think you may have to help me out here. Well, oh, I can do that. Uh, let, me just, let me just pop open the tunage here. Uh, I will then not be able to participate, but that's all right. So, Let's yes. See. uh we're going to play a clip. This, well, will you introduce? This is your bit. It's Name That Tune on the Arcade Radio Podcast. But we got to come up with a better name. It's Name That Tune on Back <laughs> to the Cade on the Arcade Radio. Legendary Dan. Okay, whatever. I have 10 songs that were uh, in the top 10 in the U.S. on January 21st, 1986. <laughs> we're going to go in reverse order. Some of these are going to be pretty difficult, and uh, let's just t- uh, start with number 10. All right, we're just going to play a clip of it, right? A clip, yeah. And I recommend... Uh, no, play the whole song. No, I mean, yes, play a clip. I-, I recommend jumping in around 1 minute and 15 seconds. For this one? Okay, all right. I'm yes. going to go right here. That's it. That's the clip. Wow. That's pretty good. And so now we wait for the uh, like 10 or 15 people in the chat to figure out what the heck's on. Oh, oh, how do you do that? Casey did it. He's got well, spite. He, he already I got he was it. saying the title, though, when we jumped to that sub. I didn't. That's amazing. Yeah. McCartney. He got it. First one. All right. Paul so uh, that, was, that was impressive. Uh, yes. Spies like us. Now, let me... I got to move this over here so I can do this at the same time. Oh, this is a good one. I love this song. All right. Um, I'm just going to pick a random spot. Or did you, did you already have a spot? No, I don't. Okay. I didn't get that far. Uh, <laughs> we got 
uh, song number one. And yeah, here we go. Um, I got to play it first. And we don't, I really have to have these queued up. So here we go. Um, the next song, song number two, here's a little clip. And <laughs> that's good. That's a good spot. I mean, uh, Tony, are you are you getting any of these? I am. I... Oh, we we just lost we Tony. Lost Tony, it's okay. He'll he, come back. He'll come back. I think he was saying he is getting them. So again, party all the time. But Casey got it again. Now nobody's like looking this up, right? Because I mean, I've pretty much said the day that we're picking. Maybe I should like. They're very good. Oh, that's what you're saying. Yeah, like if 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 you guys look this up, that's not fair. But uh, everybody on honor system, right? Yeah. Oh, it's totally yeah. Oh, if if give zero FX is is uh, giving us his word, then I'm I'm into it. He's a he's a Houston collector. <laughs> All right. No let's... time. No time to Google. So this is real. All right. Good. Oh, well, that's right. So let's go to number eight. And uh, this one doesn't ring a bell, but I'm ready. I'm just going to the middle of the song here because I I don't I don't Same remember thing. it either. But here we go. Wing it, boy. This <laughs> I, I I recognize it now that it played a little bit. But now this is that's a tough one. Maybe we play another clip. I don't know. No time to Google, Doctor Jones. So let's try this again. I'm try to do another little clip. Sure. Okay. Oh, that that should give it right oh. there. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we're we're gonna make Tony guess number five. Okay, is it is it by a UK singer? No. Oh. Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> da, da, da. No oh, pressure. we had Gloria Stefan in there. Mm, I'm gonna give one more clip. Here we go. Oh boy, that's a crap song. I hate it. <laughs> yeah, whatever it is, it's pretty dreadful. <laughs> I think somebody was gaming the system to get that up into this top ten. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's one of those ballads that you know in the late '80s. Oh my God, I'm sure. I'm sure I probably danced at a, one of our junior high dances to this thing. Right. I'm gonna. I'm gonna play one more. Diana Ross was the guest. <laughs> I'm gonna get. Uh, uh. It's not even the chorus we had to listen to. That was "I Miss You" by Climax. All right, all right. We're gonna have to do the next one here. Let's. Uh, this this one should be uh, pretty simple, I think. Um, I, I'm I'm just guessing, but I'm thinking that it, it should be pretty simple. Yeah. I I actually uh, sang um, one of the, these their songs. I, karaoke last night so uh where did you get for karaoke uh it, it was uh in-house karaoke oh uh, nice yeah all right here we go i'm gonna just play the beginning of the song here we go that's it <laughs> <laughs> should i do another clip <laughs> that might that might be enough that's a fun song. The that whole is a... Dire Straits album is great. Oh! oh <laughs> Shipley's Donuts. <laughs> Shipley's Donuts. Yeah. <laughs> fun records. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Casey got it. <laughs> <laughs> but if which Dire Straits... Oh, he, oh, he got it. He said he got, he got Walk of Life. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. All right. Wow, what... Did, you know what? If the 80s was diverse, at least, you know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of things that don't sound a lot alike were popular. Yeah. So this next one, uh, don't say the artist. <laughs> did I just play the clip? I think I did. Barely. Just a tease. All right. Well, let's play that again. It won't take much. Yeah. No, that's pretty good. A lot of these, you just play the beginning and people can get it. So I'm going to play that clip one more time. <laughs> Saying elsewhere. <No. laughs> you could, yeah. 
Yeah. The next one is going to be good. Casey got it again. Man, he's good. He's like a machine. Yeah. We're going to have to send him a t-shirt. Okay, so, Tony, I'm thinking you, you might be able to get this one. Maybe. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm only going to play the beginning of this one, too, because it's not going to take much at all. Mm-hmm. So. When you say that now. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, should I just play that? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay, let's try this. You bad. Oh. Oh, uh, jo- uh, George Michael? Yeah. Yeah. But... <laughs> I, I, I'm your man. Oh. Yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> there you go. That is oh, hilarious. No, wham, wham, isn't it? Is yep. that Wham? Or it's wham. It is wham, yes. Yep. Wham, okay. We'll give you a George Michael, though. That was That's close enough. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think they they were they they changed their name to Wham with George Michael at some point. So, well, the, I mean, I think they the, the when American they, advertising did when they did Careless okay. Whisper. Uh, that's when it Sorry. really became George Michael. I think actually the forty five the single here in the states may have had that uh, George Michael on that. So uh, the next one is one of my favorites because I'm a big fan of this person. <laughs> Okay. Uh, um, I've seen this person in concert several, Me too. several times. So great, great song. I love this person. That's it. Jeez. <laughs> That's a one second clip. Oh, no, it's not Prince. Nope. Uh, well, if Casey can't get it right away, you got to give him another, another taste. Yeah. All right. Here we go. That's pretty good. I'll play a three second clip in one. Here we go. That's a much better clip. Don't you think? That's classic. It makes me want to dance around in circles with my arms stretched out. <laughs> nice. <laughs> like in Wonder Woman. It's Wonder Woman. It's Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> so this Hungry. must have been the year that uh, Rocky Four came out. Mm, I think so. I think they're not getting it. Okay, that is "Talk to Me" by Stevie Nicks. All right, "Burning Heart." Oh, damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Who's the artist? I already gave a song. <laughs> what an idiot. See, I knew you would do it. It's okay. <laughs> I was reading it. I was reading it on the screen and I just like said it out loud. It's like that game show that uh they have on SNL where I said the name. You're not supposed to say the name. <laughs> <laughs> was that ten thousand dollar pyramid or something where they couldn't say the whole name Correct. too? Which, yeah. Survivor. Correct. Frank Stallone. Frank Stallone, no. But good guess. <laughs> He he did do a song for Rocky. It was gonna fly yes. now. Okay, number two is this is easy. Come on. Okay. Uh oh, I gotta I gotta do the oh. What do you got? Oh I'm distracted because there's a there's a four hundred and fifty dollar Donkey Kong for sale on Craigslist. What? At this moment. Yep. How, how do oh, you, you need to go, man? Go. Go get it. I'm making uh, my buddy go get it. I need oh, one. Aaron, who was on the show last uh, last time. He's gonna go grab it. I think oh, he can pull man. the trigger. Four hundred bucks. Four fifty. Still, whatever. The monitor is worth two hundred, three hundred, easy. Yeah. Oh. That's it. I'm not giving any more. Wow. I like the idea of playing the intro. Yeah. Plus, it's, it's easy for you to cue pick up. that. Yeah. Here we go. One more time. I th- this so Tony. One of the problems we had on the show was we were playing clips of songs, you know, probably only fifteen, twenty seconds, fifteen seconds, and we we keep getting monetized by the um, Universal Movie Group and you know music oh, group, group, and you know people keep flagging it for copyright dispute. So 
we're getting around that now by playing like a three second clip and having the audience guess the song, which is super fun. <laughs> <laughs> Takes up a little more time, but I I'm I kind of enjoy this part of it. So we had Lionel Richie yeah. say you say me. Casey's just all over these. I don't even know how, if anybody else wants to compete he against knows him. them all. All right, so uh, that brings us to number one, which um, is a not great song, if you ask it's me. It's one of the favorites of the Psychic Network. <laughs> oh, God. You just maybe we could just give them hints about the song, and they could guess what it what it's yes, about. The psychic Network. I'm um, actually. Oh, here we go. Um, wait a minute. I have two. Oh, there's. That's funny. Is there another song with the same title? Yeah. It's uh, from the Jungle Book soundtrack. <laughs> oh, no. Is this the right one? No, this isn't it. This is the wrong one. Here, let me pull up the right one. And actually, this has a UK crossover. Right? Does it? Yeah, for sure. Oh, right. Who's the person she's singing with? That's right. There's four people or, in this song. E. Yeah. Right? Oh, wow. Yeah, now I'm remembering that. Oh, there's an ad. I because I I don't have this song, so I have to go, I have to wait for the ad to play. Oh so, ne- but next time we'll I'll have them all queued up for right. you because Me too. yeah, we were, Casey got it. Mark was gonna try to do it. He got it already. He's like wrong. He's Dion Warwick. <laughs> That's funny. All right, here we go. <laughs> And the UK connection is Carol Spinney? No. She's singing with three no, wait, th- three other people. Stevie Wonder. Right. Gladys Knight and Ozzy Osbourne. Elton John. Ah, Dude, yeah. that would have been amazing with Ozzy. That, w- that would have <laughs> been great. <laughs> what are the lyrics? <laughs> so Hey, Tony, where were you on January 21st, 1986? Oh, man, I was, well, well, I'll tell you, I would have been at school and I would have been doing my, what we call A-levels. I don't know what you would call them. So I would have been about 17. Hmm. Okay. He he just gave it away. He's just a tad bit older than me, maybe the same age as you. Yeah. A-levels. I like that. So it's way better than what? 12th grade in the states but um we you do o levels at 15 and then you do a levels at 17 18 i don't know this this just popped into my head when you said that mark and i i I don't know that we'll have another we'll probably have another show where we're closer to this date but you guys also remember that that's when the challenger disaster happened january of 86 oh yeah just seven days away so where was that is that right yeah. I was actually off ill that day at home. I remember it very well. And my mother was on the telephone to her sister and I was watching the TV. And of course it happened. And I, I swore out loud and she went crazy. Mm-hmm. And I said, I said, yeah, but look, look at the TV. And she then swore out loud. Yeah. Was a, did, yeah. I was eating, I, remember. I was eating a chili and cheese burrito in the band hall at my high school. I was in math class. Um, we had TVs in every room. I think the reason that was so highly publicized was because it was the first time a civilian had gone up, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. The, the, the teacher from New Hampshire. Yeah. So anyway, um, God rest Let's their souls. Go. And <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of the space shuttle program, and I was sad to see it go. But in fact, I I saw a space shuttle for sale in Fort Wayne, Indiana today. What? For a thousand bucks. Oh, the pinball. I thought an actual space shuttle. That's amazing. Yeah, for a thousand bucks. It's a little rickety. It's missing a few tiles. It probably won't make it to space. It may have been Russian. <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh that was back to the cade with Mark. Uh, we should probably check the voicemails. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, there's one in the hopper. What, what, wouldn't uh, wouldn't you know? <laughs> Wouldn't, Bring it on, dude. Wouldn't you know? Here we go. Hey, Arcade Radio. Ted, guys. Dude, this is your buddy, Bob Power today. Control panel expert. I have three quick topics to cover that I want you to discuss. Oh, this is old. 
What in the world is that? That's the old. That's an old one. How did that get in there? I don't know. He's got three topics. That doesn't make any sense. What was that? I don't know. Let's try. Let's try that again. Huh? Well, that's that's very strange. Oh no! What? Botany Bay. <laughs> Botany Bay. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> this isn't SETI Alpha Five, is it? <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's um, that's pretty funny. All right, well, we'll, we'll just uh, we'll just play it raw. We're gonna play it raw right here. Oh, there, there it is. I found it. My bad. I'm so sorry. Here we go. Hello, Arcade Radio Podcast Team. It's your buddy Bob Zarzadek, Control Panel. Is that quiet? Sounds, that, seems... that sounds pretty good. I, I, I just think it could be better. Okay, let's start it over. All right, here we go. All right. Hello, Arcade Radio Podcast Team. It's your buddy, Bob Zarzadek. That's better. Control Panel Expert slash Technician. Technician? Uh, I'm coming to you from the Autonomous Spaceport Drone Ship. Uh, have you ever heard of SpaceX? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I rented a boat, and now I'm totally vacationing on this platform. There's nobody here, man. It's freaking autonomous, hence the name. I love it. Uh, I only have to hide when the drone ship docks itself. Uh, but in the meantime, they have like a ton of ice, astronaut ice cream. And, uh, you know, I'm totally set on that. Uh, as for today's show with Tony Temple, uh, let me just ask one question. Uh, Tony, is it annoying that there are no talking video games that have a British accent? Feel free to answer that one at your leisure. All righty, I'm I'm out of here, guys. Uh, Got to get back to my drone ship paradise. Zarzadek out. I think Zarzadek has up- upgraded his his talents. Yeah, he's gone way from... better than living in a. <laughs> yeah, he's well. Not only That's has he container. moved, but he he upgraded. He's he's not just a control panel expert anymore. He's a technician. I guess he broke a control panel and had to fix it. Oh, some parallels with. Your life, Mark. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so, Tony, I'll have to answer that question. Well, it's um, uh, uh, n- not really. <laughs> you know, I think um, I think things that have an American accent to us over here give the gives them like a little bit more authority. So, I've noticed when there's a boxing match over here, all of the announcers, like the ringmaster. They all try to replicate that guy. Who's that guy? That you know that. Let's get ready to rumble. Yeah, and it, and it you know it kind of adds to the to the atmosphere. It sort of gives it a, a certain authenticity. authority. Okay. Yeah, an authenticity, like a you know an an authority. So I wouldn't say so. I I think video games being you know US centric, I think we it just sort of added to the whole mystique of video games it's funny i'm reminded that there was a tram at the minneapolis airport and the the woman that you know the audio recording she had a british accent and i thought that was like very classy (laughs) (laughs) but they they replaced it eventually with just somebody with an english accent yeah they didn't change any of the verbiage no they just what were people confused about what country they were in what's up with that i actually liked her too that it seemed uh, maybe people thought it was I don't know I don't know I, I I don't know why they changed it but I think it sounded more sophisticated. I have it recorded. I'm going to get you a clip for the next show. Oh, good. Yeah, if you go to London, the um, the announcer on the tube trains, um, you know, the underground, when you it says the next station is Marble Arch, and you know, it sort of sounds you know Princess Diana, very very classic English. Um, but there's also, uh, so we obviously get most of the major movie releases over, over here. And, um, the other thing you get, um, is the, the, uh, trailer voiceover guy. You must have a guy over there who does the voiceover for every single movie trailer that there ever was and will continue to be in a world. So we get all of those as well. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it, it isn't a movie trailer without that guy's voice. Yeah. And we, we get all of those as well. So I think some things just wouldn't work with a British accent. So, you know, I think in that respect, American voiceovers do work over here. Excellent. Hmm. Well, you know, we're finally going to get to go to the interview. I'm I, excited. Yeah, this is the this is the funnest part of the show now, right? Well, I mean, if you good. say so. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is going to be good. I can tell. I can tell right now. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Please welcome to the show one more time, Tony Temple. Yeah! Woohoo! <laughs> Hello. <laughs> welcome to the show. <laughs> so we, I cut you off earlier in the show because you were about to tell us your pr- proverbial origin story of, you know, how you kind of got into arcades and, you know, when and where and all that good stuff. So um, tell us your fascination with arcades over there in the UK, when, where, and your proverbial origin story, as it were. Yeah, my um, so we you know we 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 had most of the games that you guys had over there, and the bulk of machines that I saw would have been Atari. So I know I guess we're probably going back seventy eight something like that. And our, our family went to the coast, and we went into an arcade, and my dad sat me in a machine which I now know to be Night Driver. Oh and yeah, great game. Old, I always remember it. He 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 sat me in the, in this, and it was the the sort of cockpit version, the one without the roof. So it was a sit down, molded fiberglass thing. Yeah. If you, if, if you guys have ever seen one, and for some reason there was a crash helmet on top of the monitor, and I assume this was some early attempt to make it more immersive. So my dad sat me down. You know, my my nine year old self sat me down put this crash helmet on my head and I'd never had a crash helmet on my head before, you know, put a coin in and press start. And there I was driving a car. And I think at that point I was, you know, completely captivated by this thing that was, you know, that I could just see this was the future. Um, and then, you know, fast forward a bit uh, to 1980, 81 and uh, missile command turned up, which is, it is obviously my, it's obviously my game and my nemesis. And uh, I I played Missile Command when many other people didn't, and um, I this 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 big trackball was I was just fascinated by the trackball and the ability to you know control the game with a ball. It, it was I'd never seen one before. It was instead of left, right, up, down with a traditional joystick, you you could do you know amazing things with this with this trackball, and it it just completely captivated me. Um, and then, of course, you know, the arcades died and uh, I had to go to school and, and get a job and get married and have kids and stuff. And then I guess uh, 20 years later, I discovered eBay and, um, you know, came to realize that people were selling old arcade machines. So I I bought a Defender was my first uh, my first acquisition. And of course, you know, like like all of us sad old married men but not much else in our lives it, it, it just kind of took me back to you know the happier time of the 80s um and uh that uh you know was 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 quite a revelation and um my arcade uh my, my sort of current involvement with classic arcade machines started there i would say probably about 10 years ago and um, you know, as we stand today, I think I have uh, about a dozen machines altogether in various states of disrepair. Um, <laughs> it's probably, I've got three or four in the garage, which are in pieces, and I have about eight up here in the the loft arcade. That's cool. So what do you, what do you call so your arcade my, up there? The loft arcade. The loft arcade. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So. You know, as every sensible collector will tell you, the best place to have an arcade is up three flights of windy stairs. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. I my, just, my, well, mine I is mean, in, in the basement. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, yeah. But um, I can just about get them up here if I strip everything out and just carry the shells up. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Temple 
plays no part in it and <laughs> refuses to ever ever carry a machine up the stairs again. And so um, I, <laughs> I typically have to wait until you know one of my friends comes around and I say, "Could you just do me a favour and help me carry this centipede up three flights of stairs?" Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, so um, hopefully, if we ever move house, I, my next arcade will be on the ground floor. Well, that's you know, it's funny. I have a basement arcade, so I I have the same woes. There's a certain irony in you having these games in a loft, uh, considering at least one or two of your articles have some interesting finds in precarious places. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> um. So. So. Yeah. I mean, you obviously. Met- making reference to the blog so um yeah I, I i have have written for on and off for various websites over the years and um many of those websites have since disappeared and uh you know i really got to the point where i thought you know, if i want to you know create a great classic arcade blog I, i'm i'm really going to have to do it myself so it, it was really born out of a observation and frustration that i i couldn't really find the arcade blog stroke website that I really wanted to see. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm genuinely and far from expert on any of this stuff. Um, but I kind of recognize that, you know, people don't want to go to a website about classic arcade machines and read posts like, this is my game of the week and right. I'm going to write about Defender and I'm going to link to a YouTube video and cut and paste stuff that I found on Wikipedia. But, you know, I just don't think that's interesting because anybody who's interested in classic arcade games knows what Defender is. They know the basic idea of Defender. They know how to play the game. Thank you very much. I don't need to read about it. <laughs> um, so, you know, I just thought, well, you know, if I'm going to write about Defender, I'm going to do it from a sort of left field kind of deep dive point of view so rather than just writing about how to play defender or you know some basic facts about defender that i think most people know or can find out for themselves i i just kind of stumble across things or i'll stumble across a very old interview with with somebody who had something to do with defender for example um and i'll start writing from that perspective um so I, I mean, th- this week's article is about Tempest, and um, there's a, you know many ways you can write about Tempest. But you know, I just thought I'd write about it from a from the writer's point of view, the guy who designed the game, Dave Toyer, and um, I, and, and just sort of pulled out some very old. I found a really old interview that somebody did with um, Dave Toyer back in '94 or something, and it was on an old GeoSites website. Um, which of course has disappeared for the life of me i can't remember how i found it but i i think it was through is it waybackmachine.org the, the the internet archive and um there was just some really interesting quotes there and i thought well you know this website has long disappeared it would be great to sort of pull pull out some of these quotes from the horse's mouth and repackage it and you know put some interesting documents with it and so that's that, that that's kind of how i um construct articles and uh, sorry i should probably answer your question <laughs> it's funny because uh, <laughs> these are more, this is great more, this is great i mean okay. we we the first of all where is your website how do i okay, so it's more? um arcade blogger.com excellent so uh, and just so everybody knows uh obviously the arcade blogger he's got you know tony temples on facebook he posts his uh his links. Um, I don't know how regularly you write uh, new articles. Uh, do you try to do a certain uh, time period, like one a week or one a month, or is it just kind of when you get inspired? Or well, I I, I wanted to make a commitment to it. So, um, and uh, you know, obviously having a job, sadly, and uh, wife <laughs> and children, and you know, re- real life. Um, I've made a commitment to write once a week. So every Friday evening my time um i tend to put something up and then you know sort of try to get the word out on on facebook and club and you know anywhere where i think people might might be interested over the next couple of days so every week there's something new um and i try to write about a thousand words so you know i want it to be meaty i want i want people to come and know you know even if they've missed it for a few weeks that they can sit for an hour and they can play through some really old 
you know, um, some, some really cool stuff. And it's a meaty read, you know, it's, it's something to get your, uh, to get your, uh, your teeth into. So on, on this show, we've referenced, uh, uh, Tim Stryker's Astrak, uh, the final chapter. Um, we've also yeah. talked about the, uh, I believe the, 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 the loft article that I was just mentioning is the arcade raid where there was a computer space found in a, in a barn. There's a fun twist to that one. If you haven't read it, go ahead and read it. It's fantastic. Um, and we, and I know we've used other portions of your, um, you know, <laughs> your articles for, for our show, because it's one of the more interesting, a uh, classic arcade, well, it, it, to me, it's the only classic arcade source that's digging in as deep. And you mentioned you got this article. Did you use like the Wayback Machine to pull the website up and get those quotes or how, do, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I, 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 someone said to me that there was a load of um, guys used to post pictures of arcade raids in the 90s, mm -hmm. um, which is obviously be, before my time in the scene. And, and, you know, clearly over in the U.S., there was a lot of low hanging fruit in the nineties in terms of warehouses full of arcades. And I think I was just on a mission to see if I could find some of those pictures, maybe reach out to the guys who posted them and say, look, you know, this, this stuff has disappeared long ago. Do you mind if I ask you six questions and use your pictures and, and, uh, you know, write the raid up and, uh, and, uh, and sort of archive it and share it with the world again. And, um, quite a few of those arcade raid stories that I've told already, um, have been done in that way where i've just stumbled across a series of photos and thought man these are great you know people like looking at pictures of shitty dusty old arcade machines and i've managed to find the guy who posted them and just dropped him a line and often they'll say right you know i haven't collected for over a decade but yeah you know feel free and that and, and that's been great and I, and I think that some some of the those quotes on the tempest article was you know where you start looking for one thing and you end up on a completely unrelated website um so yeah it, it's it, it's just about sort of doing a bit of um deep diving but the arcade raid stories i think are, are, are fantastic because you know it, i think the the thing you learn about this hobby pretty quickly is um the machines are really just the backdrop and actually it's about people and it's about it's about having a laugh. It's about meet, meeting people. And the thing that bonds you obviously is arcade machines, but actually the reality is you're really into people. And um, I think the way groups of people come together to find arcade machines, I think that's, that's the real story. And for me, that's what opens it up to a much wider audience. Yeah. Um, and I, and I find in what I'm trying to do in the blog is to write about the subject matter in a way that is accessible not only um to you guys who are obviously collectors and really into this stuff but also try to appeal to the general public um you know tim striker's as track story is is one of those stories and that 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 blew up massively and that was um you know all over reddit it was um on several mainstream websites and it, 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 because the story itself is so interesting, you know, Asterak, Smashterak, so what? And I'm I'm sort of partly like that as well. You know, it's Asterak. It, it's an interesting game. It's, it turns out it was a great game to play. Um, but actually, that's not the hook that's going to get people in. You know, what's going to get people in is this interesting tale of, of this guy, of this, you know, very early Elon Musk, if you like, who was way ahead of his time who at one small point in his career happened to write one of the last color vector games. Um, and then he took his own life. And then, you know, there were only a couple of hundred of these machines released. And then several years later, somebody bought an Astrak machine from Craigslist, got it home, um, opened it up, and it turned out to belong to the guy who wrote the machine. Um, and then it just sort of spidered off. And then the, the guy's family read the article on my blog they wrote to me directly and said thank you so much for um you know writing about you know our late relative it's you know very kind of you and it's great that a, a light was shone on it and then they shared some pictures and then and then it all ended up in florida where the machine was restored and revealed at the florida event and 20 members of tim's family turned up to see the reveal which was which was great and so it's it's these 
for me, it's these human bits of the story and you know, whether it's an arcade raid, it's a group of people getting together and a bunch of us drove to France a few months back and we, you know, we had this great road trip. We found some fantastic machines and we came back and it was, you know, bonding and it was a great story. And then that's the interesting bit for me. The, the machines are the backdrop. I mean, it, you know, I could be writing about stamp collecting, frankly. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's about interesting pictures and uh, people. And wherever those people come into the story, I think that's the important bit. Whether it's, you know, Dave Dave Toyer working for 48 hours straight to get Tempest out the door, or whether it's me and a group of guys hiring vans and driving for yeah. 12 hours to go and collect arcade machines, or whether it's, you know, a late developer's family turning up in Florida, or whether it's me trying to work out how to fix an asteroid. <laughs> um you know, for me, there's some interesting elements in there, and that's 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 really what I try to bring out in the blog. And um, you know, I think it's working, and I, I have a very wide readership. It isn't it isn't just guys from Clove coming along, yeah, to get their fix. It's um, it, it's all sorts of people, and and you know, the feedback's been great. That's awesome. Yeah, we have some parallels, I think. Um, um, you you don't <clears throat> you you're not meeting Dan today, but Dan Reed and I and Mark. Oh, you know we we all met because we're local collectors to each other. Mark and I had a connection when he uh, purchased my Tron restoration machine, a restored machine, um, and then <clears throat> Dan and I met when we did an arcade raid with a bunch of guys. What was more of a uh, we went to a a common place where uh, a lot of games are we know are stored to do sort of. Uh, uh, I don't know, an excavation, if you will. So, but he pulled a bandito out of there that day. And, you know, you just meet these guys the same way. And in, in the way that you, uh, you know, convey your thoughts and dig up these photos uh, for the blog, that was one of the things we thought we would do with the show and just have, you know, bring interesting people on and, you know, interview them. So we've had the opportunity to interview you know world record holders journalists such as yourself um you know we had um jerry buckner on the show who did uh, pac-man fever uh so right, yes. you know it's just really fun guests and i think it's a different angle we get to have a little insight into where you know everybody has a similar origin story when they were a kid they they sat in front of a machine and it uh, in some way changed their life or made them um you know made them put them in a place in their life that they remember being very happy. And so a lot of us, uh, we end up going back to that place. And, uh, now that we can afford them, there's a fascination and it's not just about, you know, having the machine, but it's a conversation piece. It's, uh, it's a hobby that affords you the, the opportunity to learn how to fix things, to learn how to paint, learn how to woodwork, um, right. all that sort of thing. And I, I think that there's a lot of parallels, um, with your story and, and ours here at arcade radio. So, um, thanks for sharing that so far. What is your favorite article out of all the articles you've written? Oh, uh, I would say it's probably, um, uh, well, I'm going to pick two. Uh, one is, um, no, three, I'm going to pick three. All right. That's good. Um, three. Okay, so uh, there was an arcade raid done, uh, which I wasn't involved with, but which I wrote about, um, which, which was very popular, and that was the Duke of Lancaster ship. And uh, if you if you go to my site, uh, click at the top on arcade articles and drop down to arcade raids, and then scroll down to the bottom. Um, it, so the Duke of Lancaster ship was literally an old uh, an old ferry ship, and um, it got dry docked. And um, they turned it into um, like a visitor attraction on the coast. So people would go to what was then called the fun ship. And, you know, you could buy a hot dog, you could go on rides, you could walk around the ship. And um, uh, an entire deck was just full of classic arcade machines. It got closed down very suddenly um, by the local authorities for, for various reasons, which is a whole other story in itself. But basically the, the ship sat there until... Um, I, I don't know, four or five years ago. And um, some uh, urban exploration guys went in there and took pictures. And one of the pictures they took showed there were arcade machines in there. And so one of the 
sort of more prominent collectors over here in the UK managed to track down the owner of the ship and made him an offer for all of the machines. So the guys went along and got all the machines out of this old ship. Um, and uh, they had to hire a crane because you couldn't get the machines off the ship without literally craning them off of the deck, you know, 100 feet below. I um, mean, it's just a just a fascinating um, treasure hunt story, if you like, um, that sort of went beyond a, a normal arcade raid. Um, that's that that was extremely popular and, and, and sort of got me a load of new readers, I think, because it went mainstream. It went it went the story went on a lot of uh, uh, news websites over here in the UK. Um, so that was a good one. Uh, I think I think the other one is the Tim Stryker Aztrak story, um, just oh, yeah. because it start it just started as a you know an interesting anecdote and then just turned into something uh, huge and um, it, it, it culminated in November. I was in I was at the Free Play Florida event in November and um, was asked to do a talk and a presentation about the Aztrak story. Um, in front of uh, Tim Stryker's wife and his kids and his grandkids and his sister and uh, a whole a whole bunch of people there. So that was really nice. It, it, it was nice to sort of break beyond the screen of my website and to actually meet meet some people and, you know, to be able to, to, to tell the story and for them to be happy with it. Um, and I think the other article was another arcade raid, and that was uh, more recent, the French raid, which I just mentioned. Um, so you know somebody posted on a uk forum that they they bought a house in france and um inside this house was uh, you know a load of old a load of old arcade games from the sort of late 70s to early 80s and you know would, would we like to go and buy them so within five days we'd organized um five vans and you know a dozen of us jumped on these vans and drove to the south of france it was like nine hours there nine hours back um and we just went into this house but some of the pictures we were able to get and some of the machines were just absolutely stunning some some really rare stuff and uh that was another popular article so you know i'd say those those three i would say are my favorite so far that's awesome <laughs> i posted those uh a couple of those in the in the chat um Aztrak, um is, is still for, fairly top of the it's only a few articles old now but i posted the other two in the chat so people could kind of poke around so if you haven't yeah, read, uh, ha have a read of that. So. I'm jumping in. I'm jumping on top of you. I, I have questions. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your personal collection that you have up there? What specific games merited bringing all the way up? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I have a, a missile command, as you'd expect. Um, so I, I hold the uh, Guinness World Record on missile command tournament mode. Um, which is basically where you get no bonus cities. Oh, wow. Um, so as you'd expect, I have a missile command, and uh, I, I, the the joke here is I'm going to be buried in, in that cabinet. So, <laughs> you know, if, if I have to liquidize my arcade collection, missile command is going to be hidden away, and that, that, that one isn't going to go anywhere. Um, uh, what else do I have? I have... Uh, I have several cabaret machines, and that's largely because I'm in such a small room with uh, with walls that slope, so I can't get too many full size cabinets in here. So I have a, uh, a, a Tempest and a Centipede arcade cabinet uh, in cabaret style. I have an Asteroids cabaret as well. Uh, I have a Donkey Kong 2 cabinet, which started out life as a generic nintendo cabinet and was the first restoration i ever did and um i i bought them from a guy in germany and uh it, the he he I, I i paid good money um mm. for this original nintendo cabinet which you just can't find over here so those nintendo cabinets that you guys know and love we never saw them over here um so to find one was uh you know quite something so I, I i got it shipped over here this polish lorry driver drove it across europe dropped it outside my house and drove away waving and i was stood there looking at this machine and you know being a it's in the early days of my collecting and restoring life 
you know, I, I had expectations that I could just plug it into the wall and it would fire up and there I, I'd be playing Donkey Kong instantly. And, you know, as we all know, arcade collecting voodoo 101 says it ain't going to work. <laughs> and sure enough, I, I, I plugged it in and something smoked and it, I was just stood there outside my house in the street looking at this machine thinking, what the hell have I done? <laughs> um uh, but but you know like everyone else i was able to just sort of break the restoration down into component parts and take the monitor out take the chassis off send the chassis to someone who knew how to repair it um and then got to work with my bondo and paint and you know made a few mistakes but you know making mistakes is, is what make is what gets you better at restorations um so that 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 i decided to turn that into a donkey kong 2 which was the add-on kit to Donkey Kong that uh, somebody produced many years many years back. Um, so that that runs Donkey Kong Two and uh, the original Donkey Kong game. And then next to that, I have uh, next to that I have a Universal Cosmic Gorilla, uh, which, which I picked up from eBay pretty cheap. Um, it didn't need a great deal doing to it; it just needed sort of stripping down and cleaning up. Um, and I got the board off to repair. Amazingly, the monitor still works. Um, it's the black and white version. I'm very pleased with that. It's, it's, it's a great looking machine. Uh, and finally, I have a, a Nintendo cocktail, which is running Space Fever, which was uh, Nintendo's version of uh, Space Invaders. So that's what I have in, in the arcade. Um, stuff that I hope to bring up soon. I have a, uh, a Gravitar upright. Uh, which is just a beautiful, spectacular-looking, glorious thing. Yeah. Um, that you, you guys made reference earlier to how we sort of look at these games um, through our adult eyes, and I'm pretty sure if if I came across Gravatar when I was 15, and I can't say I ever did, but I imagine if I did, I would have looked at it, played it a couple of times, and thought, "Well, this is just, you know, this isn't really capturing me. It's a bit difficult. It's it's really hard." But having the ability to look look back on something like Gravitar now, as as a as a uh, as an adult, um, and and with all this sort of game playing experience we have now between the early '80s and 20, 2017, 2018, um, I have a real appreciation for the game and. Um, you know, being able to to look at something like Gravatar and Major Havoc and Black Widow, these games which weren't terribly successful, and now you can see why they weren't successful. So I can see that you know Gravatar in the arcades back then with an unreliable monitor, um, you know, wouldn't have been terribly popular. But looking at it now, it's just fantastic. There's so much depth in it. There's a lot of precision involved. You know, it isn't it isn't Frogger, it isn't Pac-Man. It's it's you have to you have to think about it. And I, and I think it's um, immersive qualities are um, you know really underappreciated. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 looking forward to getting Gravatar up. Um, I also have a I also me, have a just a second here. So no, go ahead. Uh, did you know that Gravatar was featured in the uh, Roger Moore, not Roger Moore, uh, Sean Connery, a uh, one-off, Never Say Never Again. That's funny. I forgot yep. about that. Yeah. And it's a UK cabinet. And, yeah, it's, um, it's full of the, and I think there's more than one, bizarrely. I think there's like four or five if you look around the scene. Um, yeah, they're, I mean, it's almost as if it was product placement. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, but, but yeah, they, those are the Irish cab. Oh, they're um, the Irish. Okay. Version, which is not quite cabaret sized. It's sort of slightly smaller than the full upright. And the main difference is the um, the bezel and the marquee are a one piece glass sheet. Hmm. So the marquee and the bezel are actually attached to each other. So it's just a sort of single sheet of plexi um, covering the uh, covering the monitor. Um, the one I'm restoring is a is a US cab, so it's the one you guys will be more familiar with. I see. Quite how that's going to get up here and quite where it's going to go, I don't know, but I, I will find somewhere. And, um, and I, also, I also have a European Robotron. Oh, cool. Um, which is an official Williams release. The main differences between the US Robotron and the Euro Robotron is uh, the European version is black. 
So we still have the 2084 art on the sides, but the background is in black and it's a slightly different shape and design, a little bit sort of shorter and more stubby. Other than that, it's it's essentially the same game. It looks sharp though with that black, the red on black. It looks pretty sweet. So yeah, it's nice. Yeah, it's a nice looking cab. I, I, the silver is okay. I actually think I prefer the black, but um, sadly, most of the machines that I have in my collection, you can't see the artwork anyway because <laughs> they're all butted up to each other. So yeah, um, you know, this is the this is the I mean this this is the craziness of the hobby. You know, I I. I restored my Tempest and thought I really want to get some artwork on it. Um, and uh, I, I got hold of some artwork and, you know, put the artwork on and then of course slid it back in between two other machines. Right. So it's like, no one's ever going to see it. You know? <laughs> it's the same as cleaning out the, the bottom of your cabinets. It's like so many people say to me, well, why the hell do you do that? You're like, no one ever goes in there. You'll never go in there. No one's ever going to see it. <laughs> I just, just this OCD thing that, well, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to start restoring and cleaning a machine, well, you can't just clean the glass and the monitor screen. You, you've got to, you've got to take it out. You've got to clean the bolts. You've got to right. sand down the inside. You've got to. So yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm one of those. If things have to, if it's coming in my house, it, it has to look good. You know. Well, yeah, you want um, to make sure it's free of any vermin as well, right? <laughs> so. Right. Well, yeah, there's that. <laughs> you got, you got to get in there and clean it. Make sure that you know. And sometimes you will end up doing a little more work than you thought you might i th I one thing i wanted to comment on that i thought was interesting that we were talking about and you're bringing up all these machines that you have um the the amount of innovation between arcade titles as far as like controls go even in, in atari you're mentioning tempest and missile command you have a trackball you have a spinner uh star wars had a yoke um you know arguably very unique for the time um and you had um variations of that yoke on stun runner uh and other games but joystick games like robotron two joysticks instead of a fire button they were always trying to think of uh different ways to have the player interact and i think that's another appeal for me at least in collecting is you can play these games on a console or a, a port and they just don't they, they don't feel the same they you don't it's you can't play the game the way it was designed to be played so by uh restoring these things i think we're doing ourselves a service and um and and people who have never played them the way they should be played um get a chance to try them at your house so that's kind of fun i think that's exactly right i, I mean I, I you know i don't want to disappear up my own backside here and, and get all um you know flower power but you know i i genuinely think we we are custodians of these things and um you know l looking at the golden era of atari for, as an example um it was such a wasteful industry you know you're you're, you're, you're you know spewing out fourteen thousand upright missile command machines that probably had a six month shelf life and operators who were essentially businessmen you know they weren't looking in their crystal ball thinking, well, I'm going to hang on to this missile command machine because in 30 years time, some idiot's going to pay a thousand dollars for it. You know, it was their asset and they had to do something with it. And so if that meant, you know, painting the glorious side art over in a black gloss paint and throwing away the control panel and converting it to temper to, uh, uh, you know, street fighter or something like that, that's what they were going to do. And, you know, I think I think to be able to, for example, deconvert something like a missile command and and turn it back to what to what it once was, um, uh, is 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 just so satisfying. And I think um, you know we are doing um, video game history, you know, hell history. I you know I, I think we're doing history a, a a great service in terms of you know rescuing these machines, finding them, restoring them and you know getting them playable again um so you know where my missile command machine is going to end up in a hundred years time i don't know but i'd like to think it will still be a missile command <laughs> and it will be sitting somewhere and people will will appreciate it and and i think is it, it when you look around your machines i think it just reminds you of um 
how mad the industry was. You know, this this was the early 80s. It, it, you know, they're, they're big and loud and every cabinet is bespoke. You know, this 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 this, this wasn't the day of Jammer where you had just a, a generic cabinet that you could pull a PCB out, put another one in and suddenly overnight you've changed your game without having to do anything more than put a key in a lock, you know. Yeah. Um, and and again, this is all part of the appeal. I, I, it's just such a unique short period of time in history, and um, you know the fact that very few of these machines are around now. Um, I think is part of the draw to the hobby, especially yeah. over here. I mean, we 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 estimate um, that there's no more than a dozen missile command machines here in the UK. Wow, which mm. is amazing. It's just an amazing statistic, you know. It is. Um, yeah. So I mean, we, we are aware of about 12 machines. Wow. So that's collectors who, who have come forward and, you know, post on a on a forum and say, yeah, I own a missile command. Um, that's interesting. So very yeah. occasionally these things will turn up on eBay. But um, yeah, you know, and, uh, undoubtedly, there's going to be more out there somewhere where people uh, don't post I'm, on forums. Or I'm going to bet that they're all in Roy Schilt's basement. <laughs> Roy Schilt. <laughs> I mean, what, what can you tell us about Roy? Oh, God. You know, it's only a matter of time, wasn't it? Before you <laughs> Sorry. <it>. We, you <laughs> know, I saved it near the end so that in case you hung up on me. <laughs> <laughs> Why, Roy, um, Roy, Roy is, uh, I guess, what we would call over here a character. Yeah. That's what we call him, too. I mean, it's you know, the exact same phrase. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's only that's only because none of us want to be shot. Um, <laughs> I, he, Roy, I you know for the uninitiated, Roy, Roy is the uh, previous world record holder on missile command, and um, you know I would say there's three or four people in the world who who can play missile command. I think to the standard that we we play it to, and you know Roy is is definitely one of those guys, and he's 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 an incredible he's got an incredible eye for missile command and of, of the handful of videos I've, I've watched Roy play I, I I recognize his ability on the game so that there, there are things that only a few players can do that I, I see him do and I think yeah I do that as well you know um and but yeah he's, perhaps he's, with a little bit more modesty perhaps <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, to, I mean, I don't really want to dig any dirt on Roy. It's all out there. I mean, you know, right. people can, 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 can Google for it. But I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I turned up on the, on the world record scene, if you want to call it that, in yeah. 2006, which is, which is when I beat his school. And that, that coincided with a trip to uh, Funspot Arcade in New Hampshire. Nice. And I, and I, and I flew to Funspot with a friend of mine and, and we turned up and we met walter who i know is beyond your show and um you know all of all of the old school guys who were there yeah and, and people were obviously coming up to me and saying oh you know you must be tony i like, hear you've flown from the uk and you've you you're the missile command guy and I'm going, yeah you know very nice to meet you and i was introduced to various people and this guy came up to me and he said um you are you tony i said yeah he said oh i nice to meet you and and I mean, you're the guy you're the, the missile commander i said yeah that's right you know and uh, you know who are you and, and this guy said um my name's larry and I, w I was just passing and i thought i i thought i'd pop in so i'm thinking your name's larry you were just past just happened to be passing fun spot <laughs> an arcade in the middle of nowhere in <laughs> And you thought to yourself, I wonder if Tony Temple's going to be there. So it was a bit odd. And I, I, I thought, well, that's OK. He's, the, he's, he's American. You're, you're, you're a, you know, there's a lot of unique Americans out there. So I, I, I thought nothing more of it. And then 10 minutes later, I, I spy this guy across the arcade. So he's a good you know, 200 yards away from me. And he, he, he's pointing a camera right at me with a zoom lens on and I'm thinking, why, why would this guy be pointing a camera at me, of all people, um, while I'm on vacation with a zoom lens on? <laughs> anyway, long story sideways, I, I, I won't keep going, but Larry 
uh, whether that's his real name or not, I don't know. But Larry turned out to be a private investigator from Boston. Interesting. Um, and our friend, uh, Mr. Schilt, uh, had clearly, you know, instructed Larry to go to Funspot Arcade, find me, and um, I don't know, you know, kind of report back. You know? That's so was, weird. Was I real? Oh my gosh. Was, That's was, unreal. Yeah, it, it was pretty odd. And then um, about, oh, I don't know, almost 10 years later, footage turns up on YouTube of my interaction with Larry. So unbeknownst to me, while Larry is talking to me and asking me all sorts of questions about Missile Command, which of course, you know, I'd literally just arrived there. And I was happy to answer. He had a video camera down by his waist, which he's holding, which pointing up it, obviously pointing up at my face. So Roy has since published, you know, my conversation with this guy, or bits of my conversation with this guy. And then, I mean, it, it kind of goes on. I, I, I have, 300 plus emails from Roy in on in in my inbox which I've received over the years um he he um has you know at various points sort of denounced my score and he's brought up the subject of trackball settings man alive that's a subject um and you know what are the correct trackable settings and he's the world real world record holder on missile command and I'm not and um and, and sort of future trips to the US where I, I, I tend to go over at least once a year and to various places, like usually fun spot. And I'd arrive at a hotel and um, I'd be checking in and um, the receptionist would say, uh, ah, yeah, Mr. Temple, hold on a second. And she'd go under a desk and she'd pull out two or three bits of paper and it's phone messages from Roy where he'd sit in LA and he would ring every hotel within a five mile radius of fun spot until he found the hotel where they he found my reservation oh, and he'd, no. leave, he'd leave messages for me and his phone number and tell me to phone him back and all the rest of it. <laughs> so yeah, you know, it's it's I mean I mean, it, you know, it could have been worse. I mean, I could be the world record holder on Galaxian, which would be a lot more boring. Um, <laughs> you know, at least, at, at least I have a, at least I have a backstory, and you know, maybe a book inside me. Yeah. I can, you know, share my stories. But yeah, I, um, Roy, I haven't heard from Roy for um, probably two two years now. Um, I I know I think he's kind of disappeared off the scene now. He, I think he's had bigger fish to fish to fry, like uh, you know Billy Mitchell and you know the whole King of Kong. Yeah. The kid, when the King of Kong movie came out, you know, I, I was really grateful for because it kind of gave him a bit of a distraction. He he he, he yeah. could start um, he could start wailing on Twin Galaxies and Billy Mitchell <laughs> instead of me. So I, I was I was pretty pleased when that came out. That's funny. Um, I I don't know. Well, what, you know, I'm sure I'm going to meet him one day. I, yeah, I have no doubt. Our, that, our paths will will cross. I'd, I'd I'd love to play him. Uh, yeah, I mean, on a serious note, he, he's a great player, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm quite sure face to face he will be a completely different guy. And um, yeah, we'll share, we'll 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 share a beer. We'll have a game of doubles, and um, he'll probably beat me. And then you know, uh, he'll then proclaim himself to be the true <laughs> champion of myself. Well, but I, that's okay. I'm, I'm you know I'm happy to involve <laughs> Roy one one day. So. Uh, I, I have no doubt we we will our paths will cross. You know, I think it's interesting in this in this uh, world, uh, and you're on both sides of it. Uh, we actually talk about this uh, occasionally. There's a dichotomy and, and sort of a symbiosis, uh, symbiosis, if you will, of of collectors and res restoration guys, and then guys that hold world records. They're usually not overlapping in any way. And you're in a unique position okay. that you have both a world record and you have your own collection that you 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 dive in and you repair AR2s and you paint and you do all that sort of thing so that's actually really kind of cool i think that you you're sort of in both worlds so yeah it's true yeah and uh, you know i think it's i i think it's healthy to have a bit of perspective you know mm -hmm. um, the consequences of being the world record holder on missile command in brackets tournament settings are you know pretty insignificant I think in the grand scheme of things, it, it's a nice thing to have. I have a Guinness certificate and that's on my wall and it's framed yep. and that's, and that's very nice. And, you know, it's, it, it's a conversation piece for anybody who wants to bring it up. But, um, uh, I think, I think when, when you 
open a conversation by saying, hello, my name's Tony Temple. I'm like, Do you know I'm the world record holder? I'm <laughs> it, it is, I mean, A, A isn't a terribly British thing to do, but B, you know, I I just think anybody who introduces them, themselves and has that as their thing, I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm not sure that's a wise path to take in life. So, um, yeah. Speaking, yeah, I, speaking I, of I, restoration, I, I'm sorry. I, we all just talked over each other. Go I, ahead, Mark. I'm just saying you, you, that's one of those things you got to save. Like you just drop it, you know, randomly. Right. Yeah, or, or or just not drop it at all. I, I, it's <laughs> Christ, it's a you know, it's a, and there would be time. You know, I I would, you know, check my emails and there'd be five emails from Roy just going on and on and on about God, you know, Walter and Billy yeah. Mitchell and Missile Command and Twin Galaxies and the King of Kong and Donkey Kong and those yeah. bastards are trying to screw me over and you just think. <laughs> Roy, for Christ's sake, man! <laughs> You've got other things to do in your life. Jesus Christ! You just, you know, do you have a do you have a mortgage to pay? Do you not have for kids, your wife, just something? It's a video game, man. You know. So I, yeah, it, it, yeah, Roy. It's it's, it, you know, I I think this this hobby desperately needs characters, and um, I think uh, you know people like Bill. Billy Mitchell, people like Walter Day, people like Robert Rupchek, people like Roy Schilt. You know, I think it's very easy to sort of sit and point and laugh and criticise and and you know, but actually, they, they all occupy a space in the scene and and you know, Roy is over there somewhere on the spectrum and and come in a little bit further. You've got your Billy Mitchells and and your Walter Days, and I on the other end you've got you know complete introverted technical nerds who like the you know the the way machines were programmed or how they're put together or the, the sort of technical aspects of um diodes god knows what you know <laughs> I, I, I sort of sit somewhere in the middle and, and have a have a have a foot in all camps really yeah um but he's 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 quite the guy so quite the your missile command, since uh, you brought that thing up into your loft, did you actually restore that one yourself? Do you know I didn't? Um, missile. It, I, it's a it's a long story. I don't know how how bored you're going to be, but uh, when I bought my Defender, the monitor wasn't working, and I was very new to the scene. Someone said um, you need to get hold of a guy called um, uh, Archer McLean. And Archer was at the time probably the sort of foremost collector here in the UK. And he would go to the States, get involved in warehouse raids. And he was one of the guys who very early on was shipping containers full of classic arcade machines over from the US to the UK. And he was a, he was a very big restorer. And someone said, you need to get hold of him. And I got hold of him, went to his house and said, I'm here for a monitor. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, come with me down to the basement went down to his basement and there was a missile command and I haven't seen a missile command for like 30 years. And I went, Oh my God. And we got talking and he agreed that he would restore the missile command for me. And um, so it was restoration done, done by somebody else, but it was my, my second cabinet after defender. Awesome. That's cool. I, I restored my uh, missile command from the ground up cause I got the cabinet okay. for free. So it was totally wrecked. I'll send you uh, a link to that video. I made a little video, uh, and I sent it to uh, Rush's uh, Tom Sawyer. But it's um, it's uh, I did everything. You know the the rollers, the the control panel. I got a new one from Take Man. I, I think the one that's on yours is from Take Man as well. Um, right. I I did all the buttons. I did the. I had to replace the glass. Rich from this old game did did the glass. Um, you know. Mm -hmm. But and they did the side art, which I got from somebody who had never applied it. They had bought it and never applied it to their own, so I got it for a, a, like a hundred bucks instead of one hundred twenty-five bucks or whatever it was for the set. So, but yeah, yeah that's nice. that, you know my free okay. missile command ended up being about seven hundred bucks. So, okay. <laughs> wow. Uh, um, interestingly, uh, someone someone said to me on more than one occasion, you know, you, like you're the missile command guy. Surely you should be restoring a missile command cabinet. And um, I've never really felt the need because 
well, well I've got one and it's very nice thank you I don't you know I really don't need another but um on the raid we did a couple of weeks back in Wales uh, we came across a missile command cocktail table from Atari Island which was pretty rough um, it, it was full of mold um, so we basically stripped it for parts and we took all the buttons off um, we took the monitor out we took the board out we took the power supply out and left it there and then on the way home um, the guy I was with he sort of lo- looked at me it's just like a sort of moment of inspiration he just turned the music down in the car and looked at me and he said you know that Miss Ockerman cocktail is restorable don't you and I went yeah I feel a bit bad about it and um, he was giving me quite a hard time actually so what we've agreed is we're going to go back and we're going to pick up that um, sh- what is now a shell because we stripped it for parts and um, I'm, I'm going to try and restore it over the summer so oh, that'll cool. be good uh, I've, I've, I've never worked on an Atari cocktail before but um, how, how difficult can it be so um, yeah that, 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 that'll be good I'm kind of looking forward to that cool nice. Mark were you going to say something what? Um, yeah, I had another. I had one final question about when you mentioned writing a book. Do you actually plan on it? Since I think your writing style sort of lends yourself to something like that. Yeah, it's um, it, I've 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 been writing a I say I've been writing a book. Um, I, I have been writing a book for about five years. Um, which either says to you, I'm incredibly lazy and I haven't done much, or it's going to be of biblical proportions. Um, or maybe halfway between the two. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, sadly, it's the former. I, I'm, I'm probably at about 30,000 words, and um, uh, I would say there's probably another 30,000 words to go. Um, it is about missile commands. Um, so it's trying to tell the story of um, you know, the, the game itself, what it represented, in the early 80s, Armageddon, nuclear war, etc., and then sort of um, interwoven in is my own story about Missile Command and you know how I how I came across the game and what that meant for me and etc. But I'm finding it quite difficult um, writing a blog article about Tempest in a thousand words. You, you start becoming a home to that style of writing. Um, not that I'm a writer or a journalist or anything, but you 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 know you start at the start you have a middle and then you have an end and you think well i'm going to tell this story in a thousand words or maybe 1500 words and i'm i'm finding the same with the the book obviously writing a book is completely different to writing a blog post so i'm sort of finding that i'm telling a particular story in a thousand words and thinking well you know this book isn't going to be very long if i'm if i'm writing about the development of missile command in a thousand words it needs probably needs to be ten thousand words so um I, I'm, I'm having to sort of adapt my style and sort of go back so it's I'm, I'm trying to do i'm trying to maintain a blog and i'm when i've got you know an hour i'm trying to sort of dip in and and, and write the book whereas I, I think probably what i need to do is you know book myself into a into a log cabin somewhere up in the hills for a month and just or, sit there and just yeah and or just, an autonomous just, drone ship yeah. <laughs> right yeah <laughs> yeah oh, that Bob. Um, so yeah i i do and I've, I've had a few people say as well you know the actually the blog itself lends itself to a book so that that may well come it will be you know yeah i mean even if you were to i don't know what it would take but even if you were to compile that into some kind of coffee table book it would be so awesome with those photos um yeah precisely you know so and and the you oh, man if you haven't been there you got to go check it out because there's some just some awesome photos that you have never seen before um or and i and it's it's amazing that they're there um and in fact one of the reasons i think i got connected with you tony was because we were listening to tim uh interviewing tim on the show and we had another uh local guy who's friends with tim and somehow your name came up at, because of artwork and whatever else and uh, maybe Brendan Parker mentioned you too. I can't remember, but, um, but the, the fact that you have these unique photos and everything, uh, and very well written articles that are, um, that dive into just more than how to play defender, just as you said. So it's so much more interesting to find out like, um, uh, and see like the timestamps on, 
uh, a machine moving through a production line in your article and, uh, you know, see these arcade raids in just weird and precarious places and, uh, and just a variety of really interesting, um, fun, uh, classic arcade articles. And if, if you love classic arcades, you're listening to this show for that reason. So go to the arcade bloggers website, that's arcadeblogger.com, right? Uh, and, uh, yep. and, uh, and I just want to say it's been a pleasure having you on this show. So, uh, Absolutely. thanks a lot for, uh, taking the time out to, uh, be our guest host today. And it was an honor and a pleasure, uh, talking to you today. So. Likewise guys, thank, thank you very much. I, I, you know, I, I, I do what I do. Um, I don't do it for, for money. I just simply do it for the, the love and for us all to um, hopefully have a single place we can go to, you know, enjoy all this stuff which is out there, but it's just spread out or hidden away in the depths of, of, of Google. So um, I, I, you know, I can't take credit for most of the stuff that I uncover, but um, you know, ho- hopefully presenting it back in a in a in a good readable format is is of use to the uh, to the community and um, you know the, the wider internet world. So, well, if you're ever in the Minneapolis area or Houston, where Mark is, you know, we'll we'll uh, show you around the arcade haunts in our areas. So. Well, that sounds great. One thing I've always wanted to do is to do an arcade raid in the U.S. So uh, maybe we should talk. Yeah, that'd be fun. We we could uh, centralize it, make it uh, a destination, uh, make a weekend of it. Uh, a destination raid. Destination raid. And we'll call it. Maybe <laughs> we'll call it that. That'd be fun. I think. So, anyway, gang, thanks for listening. In. This has been Arcade Radio. This it's the double R's, two R's, Arcade and Radio. Please join us in the conversation anytime at arcaderadio.com, or you can email us at react at arcaderadio. Uh, dot com and also as you can subscribe on YouTube and uh, well iTunes and Google Play and SoundCloud so we're we're around there so if you want to subscribe go ahead and do that on your favorite uh, you know whatever and we're on Facebook too so uh, go check us out and thanks for thanks for joining us again Tony um, and we'll look forward to the next episode of Arcade Radio in, uh, in about a week and a half so thanks for thanks for being on board this. I like you trailed off. That was surprising. Yeah, I just kind of went off into the distance. You're good at that. You're good at that. Okay. This is funky. Yeah. And it's not, it's original. It's original. I did this. Good. So I'm going to probably get flagged for it and somebody's going to monetize it anyway. Son of a. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> I guess Tony hung up. No, that was me. <laughs> oh.